everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Irene Sun Wu. I'm the Director of Exhibitions here at GSAP, um, the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. And I'm also the curator of the Arthur Ross Architecture Gallery just across the lobby. Um, and we're really pleased to have you all here tonight on the occasion of Torquasi Dyson's exhibition, 1919 Blackwater. Torquese is a multidisciplinary artist based in New York by way of Chicago. And she works across sculpture, drawing, and performance with a commitment to and passion for painting. And I've really witnessed this over the past couple of months, and I can testify she's really a machine when it comes to painting. And at the core of her artistic practice as a whole is an intellectual investment in forms of environmental justice both interestingly from a historical perspective, but also importantly with a view to potential futures. Her work has been exhibited at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Grand Foundation, the Drawing Center, the Museum of Modern Art, and also the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. This past spring, she was the Robert Bothney Chair at the Cooper Union, a rotating interdis interdisciplinary professorship in art and architecture, and she continues to teach at Cooper today, and is also currently a critic at the Yale School of Art. In 2016, she joined the, bar the board of the Architectural League of New York as Vice President of Visual Arts. So over the past few years, the exhibitions program at Ross Gallery has prioritized developing new projects with architects and artists, offering them resources and space to test arguments and launch new investigations, which in turn augment and expand the research conversations and design experiments that are continuously unfolding at GSAP. We're incredibly proud to support and present this new body of work by Torquasi, which I'm confident will prompt us to reevaluate how, how we as architects, historians, teachers, and students understand the agency and limitations of representation the scope of repercussions of climate change, and the power of geometric abstraction as a visual language. And while it may at first seem curious that an architecture gallery has invited a painter to do a show, in fact, Torquasi has a lot to teach us as a discipline about the built environment and space. And really, I can't express how much I've learned uh, from Torquasi interacting with her over the past few months. Now, I can't take full credit for pu pulling Torquoise into this crazy vortex that is GSAP. I poached her from a few of my colleagues, namely Mario Gooden, the professor in the architecture program here, and who joins us as a moderator tonight, uh, and also Lila Patelier, director of events. So Mario and Lila have been trying to coordinate a drawing performance masterminded by Torquoise, and we're trying to find a space at the school for this proposed event. Having come across her work, uh, her solo, solo exhibition at the Grand Foundation, uh, and also uh, her, her project at the Drawing Center, which was the inspiration for the Grand uh, Exhibition, I kind of inserted myself uninvited into the conversation that Mario and Lila were having and inquired what was going to happen to the drawings after the performance. Maybe would Torquase want to exhibit these in the gallery. And soon after, she was essentially in residence at the gallery, uh, really set up shop, uh, and the space really became her studio, laboratory, classroom, and think tank uh, throughout this past summer. And for those of you who know Torquase, you know that she is truly a force of nature, able to crystallize critical thinking and creative production in mysterious and breathtaking and beautiful ways. And that convergence of intelligence and poetry surfaced in her proposal for the gallery to tackle the 100th anniversary of the Red Summer of 1919, a period of sweeping racial violence across the United States. And in particular, she emphasized the desire to focus on a specific act of violence that took place in the segregated waters of Chicago, her hometown. 
So I'll leave it to her to speak about the significance of this historical case study in more detail during her discussion with Laurent Brooks and Mario Gooden, and also to discuss how it was offered a lens to think through more contemporary issues concerning race, climate migration, and the architectural imagination. And Quasi certainly has an architectural imagination. So we're delighted that Laurent Brooks has joined us this evening uh, to participate in this conversation. He is currently the Associate Curator for Modern and Contemporary Collections, specializing in African American collections at the Getty Research Institute. And prior to working at the Getty, he was an Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Lehman College and a Curator for the Racial Imaginary Institute. And serving as our moderator is Mario Gooden, Associate Professor of Practice here at GC, uh, and Principal at Huff and Gooden Architects. And he also directs the Global Africa Lab with Mabel, Mabel O. Wilson. His work, writings, and lectures frequently examine architecture and the translation of cultural landscapes defined by the parameters of technology, race, class, gender, and sexuality. And before I turn it over to our esteemed speakers, um, a few other thanks are in order. And for her continued support of the gallery's programming and her consistent recognition of exhibitions as an integral part of GSEP's intellectual and creative culture, I wanted to thank our Dean, Amal Andros. And I'd also like to thank Mabel Wilson, also a professor here at GSEP, and Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, a marine biologist based in New York. Uh, each of them generously engaged for Quasi in important conversations that are included in our exhibition pamphlet. And I really encourage you to pick this up and take a read. Uh, it's, it's really um, an amazing set of conversations. And last but not least, our amazing student team who contributed to the formation and the realization of 1919 Blackwater, including Tom Nguyen, Alexander Tell, and Shea Arabe, and especially Fernanda Karlovich. I don't know where you are, uh, but you were really the MVP. Um, <laughs> got there early today and didn't show up until two minutes ago because you were working hard uh, to make things happen. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to Paola Villaplana, Lila Catelier, and everyone else in Avery 415 uh, who helped make this event possible. So with that, I'll turn it over to Torquase Mario. And uh, just straight off the bat, I want to thank Torquase for the work that you all are going to see um, next door in, in the gallery. Um, it's truly uh, a pleasure and a gift, really, to have your work here at GSEP. And to be having this conversation in this school um, at this time, uh, 400 years you know, after 1619 um, and the arrival of the first Africans on this you know, on this continent, uh, probably not the first Africans, but the first enslaved persons on this continent. Um, so I'm just uh, I'd like to start uh, perhaps with Tarquasi, if you could maybe just tell us a little bit about the the story that you're using for the historical framework um, of the paintings, for those who haven't had a chance to perhaps read about it in the pamphlet or the, the wall copy outside. Sure, thank you. I first want to thank Irene for inviting me and you for um, starting the initial conversation, all the students and all of you for joining us tonight. I really appreciate you being here. Um, that said, what I was interested in in 1919, particularly, um, was an event that happened in Lake Michigan. And this event um, was personal to me because I grew up in Chicago, swimming in Lake Michigan, on the south side of Chicago, living very close to the water. So as I learned to swim in Lake Michigan, I heard the story of a young man named Drew Williams who had been killed um, in the lake. Uh, it really, really triggered my whole sort of rubric um, of water and politics in the body. Uh, so this had been four young firemen had been swimming in the lake and there were there were segregated waters of course, segregated beaches in Chicago, and they had found this space in between the black beach and the white beach. And they had built this raft, right? So they had built this, um, what I um, consider this architectural object 
to sort of be in, play in, exist in between these two spaces. So I was very interested in that raft the moment that they decided to collect the materials, decide to be in between segregated spaces and get here or there. Um, and also understanding the, the heat of Chicago in that time that led up to the riots that sort of ran across the country. You know, black people were really migrating to Chicago. The war was over. White people were coming back. And there was a lot of conflict um, around the city, around labor and space and segregation. So when the four men one day, the black men were, black boys, I were, playing the raft, one white Chicago and had thrown rocks at them and hit Eugene and Eugene drowned. So I was really interested in their imagination and just thinking about um, that day of play, the water, the horizon, um, the making, the genius of creating a space in a non-space, right? Um, and thinking about ways to resist being told where to go, or what to do, or how to play. So it's really interested in that impulse, and um, can, I can continue to be interested in the sort of impulse to create um, a place of freedom in, in between these sort of segregated and possible geographies. So I made an exhibition about it. <laughs> you know, what gets me about the process work is that, you know, every day, you know, I look on Instagram every day, I look on the internet, and I see the danger of black bodies in space. And to come up with a term called black propositional thought, in which black people are, in some particular way, navigating or making objects or making space for themselves to be safe, or to navigate, um, or to navigate between spaces in which they are not welcome, right? And so the connection for me, uh, in terms of your work, I mean, it's not in the past, it's actually in the present. It, it's when I'm on the train, it's when I'm on the sidewalk, just as a black man, it's, it's, it's me in public space, and I constantly think about the space I hold and the space around me, am I safe? I constantly think about am I safe, and so, you know, just in terms of this work, these, these young men just made a raft. You know, they made a raft out of, out of, out of what was around them, to actually go out into the water and to feel safe out in the war, but they weren't. I mean, that's what it is. And to make work around that idea, to use abstraction to bring that work across. Because, you know, figuration, I'm not saying it's easy, but we relate to it easier. But to work with the principal ideas of the spaces that black people have historically made, to be safe and to use the sort of ideas that they created as thinkers, as a thinkers. And to make artwork out of that is close to mind. Well, I'll follow up with that because um, Ron mentioned figuration, but your work, um, and I think I read somewhere recently that uh, the abstraction is perhaps the, the tool or the mechanism to deal with these issues. Yeah. Um, so it's not about the kind of literal representation, but abstraction and translation at the same time. So I'm wondering if you might sort of talk to us about the what it is that you're sort of translating, are the particular elements of, of the story that you're interested in translating, or um, and, and how that relates sort of architecturally, do you think, to, to your broader interest? So yes, I've um, come to abstraction as very much a tool. So if you can imagine <clears throat> thinking about these histories of black bodies self-liberating over time and today, I am trying to understand um, that condition of both inventing under duress, inventing with materials around you, and inventing while uh, the sort of systemic order of degradation is always happening, right? So there's a sort of simultaneity in the, I think, genius of black people who can really create um, even a temporary, a safe space. So they have to know infrastructure, they have to know material, they have to know their own body weight, they have to know the 
even um, um, affecting like over time how things work, right, materially in relationship to their bodies. So abstraction allows me to understand the system that they create in relationships to the system that the systems that they are trying to navigate, negotiate, and critique and be free in. Right. So it's a way of thinking about Eugene. Um, and the young man thinking about the horizon, right? Thinking about the raft, the, uh, below, above. Thinking about the distance from taking materials from the train tracks and bringing them to the water. Thinking about buoyancy, thinking about understanding how buoyancy works and ties. They have to figure that out, right? So the idea of transparency, opacity, movement, distance, space, I'm interested in abstraction getting me closer to understanding how brilliant they were, right? In these different ecosystems. And then that same understanding that genius, just by that research, you understand all the other systems, right? So in that decision, they are always center subject. They are always the center of the beauty of it all, right? Um, and the tragedy of it all. But that's what abstraction does for me. And it's interesting, Monique Long is in the audience, and I was thinking about this um, maybe late 2014 um, when I was making all of these sort of architectural objects that I didn't think about as architectural objects. I was in the solar panel at the time trying to you know, provide free solar energy and think about <laughs> solar technology and get off the grid. I wasn't, really wasn't thinking about paying. So I was uh, making all of these crazy architectural architectural objects just to hold the solar system, right? You got this battery bank, you got the, uh, the, the systems, you got the solar, uh, you got the panels. So architecture just became to me as something that would hold solar systems, right? So then one day it dawned on me, I was like, wow, I can, wait a minute, I can draw something and then somebody build the thing that I draw? <laughs> Is that a thing? <laughs> right. um, so it clicked. That I, if I could do that, then I could unmake things too. So I started unmaking slave castles, right? Or architectural buildings that were built to transport material, then rebuilt to transport bodies. So it's like, whoa, I can. I've been to Elmina with my mother when she was in a Fulbright scholar in Ghana. And I was like, whoa, I could take those stairs away where they would bring enslaved women up to make them. Like, I could get rid of the stairs get rid of the door of no return, right? So for me, thinking uh, abstractly through architecture allowed me to understand, to engage those systems. So here I am now, like, okay, it's a way to understand things, you know? So I was a little long-winded, but. No, no, that's great. I mean, it seems also to me that one of the things that strikes me about this new body of work, and I read it, her introduction mentioned your force of a painter, that you were a painter. But the paintings, uh, I would describe the paintings as constructions, like not paintings in a traditional sense. Um, and even though you started with the, with the story of, of the boys, um, the paintings are not representing the story. But it seems to me that you have constructed a history or constructed a telling of that story. And so the the paintings exist between, yes, painting, but also architecture um, in the way that they're constructed. And you all will see the, I'll, I'll call them found objects, but perhaps there are objects which are beginning to index certain things. But it's very much a kind of constructed condition. And so I think that, you know, that's something that you know, we in the architecture school perhaps can take away in terms of thinking about narrative and how do we translate that in terms of architecture, if that is a tool or abstraction, how do we translate that in terms of architecture, if that is a tool. And what gets me too is, is where do you fit into the narrative, right? And so, you know, where do you start in terms of uh, narration storytelling? How do you understand the source material, material in terms of the, the story you're feeding from, and then where do where, where do you come in? And so the, the the paintings are paintings, but they're not paintings. They're also telling of an interaction between artists 
and a history artist and an environment artist and histories of space, a faker meeting fakers. You know, one of the things that we do, the way in which you gave those young men the dignity and the respect to respect them as fakers, those young black men to respect them as, as people who can make a rap. I can't make a rap. <laughs> you know? and, and if I made the rap, I would not take it out into the water. Right? Right? But, but, but they did, and they were having fun, and it was a space for them to, to sort of exist in the world and on the water. And, and right, they're looking at the right, they're looking at the horizon, you know, when it gets dark, they're looking at the stars. It's a whole condition of, of thinking that you're interacting with, that you're engaging, and that you're repositioning and constructing an environment for us to then enter that space. You know, I, I think that's it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I engage with thinkers. Yeah, yeah, that's very, very true. And I say that because I think that that's exactly my politic, right, around using geometric abstraction in particular. Because I'm not sure, you know, thinking about those five men, and of course I talk about Fox Brown a lot, and Harriet Jacobs, how when how did they figure all of that out? Like the genius around figuring those things out over time, moment by moment, um, and to engage their cognitive ability through my own imagination, right? Because there's no image of the raft, right? It's talked about maybe only twice. But when I heard that they had built this object on the water, and I'm a diver, so I know water, I know it's, 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 you should be afraid of it. And to, you know, understand that, it, that space and getting at those histories and making paintings about it, it really gets me closer to them. It is an homage to their um, engineering selves, their architectural selves, their creative selves, their poetic selves, right, all these people, right? So I, I guess my paintings are a way to think about how they did that as a preemptive strategy to think about what we're gonna have to do in climate change, right? So if there's a history of, say, black compositional thought, and these people were using um, a kind of genius around space and material and movement in real time and on their bodies and imagining places, imagining things. How are we going to figure out motion and movement and climate movement as the waters rise, right? Um, so in, in, in a way, the work both dealing with space, motion, movement, migration is to enter the history of painting to say, well, we need to be thinking about these kinds of tools to figure out what's going to happen um, to our physical environments, right? Um, but also, how do we figure that out? I think we look at the history of black spatial genius to figure that out. So it's, it's, a, it's a way to, you know, not necessarily translate, but it is a translation, but it's a way to uh, really understand or take notes or index or be in relationship to that kind of knowledge. Right? And the only thing that can get me there is my imagination, and then I make the objects, and then there are some physics that come in. So but the, that's, but that's right, I'm trying to get to those, get to that part of uh, that human perception, thinking, genius, that black people have in that way. But the, but the paintings, the construction, I'll call it my instructions, they don't really reveal it. They don't reveal it all. I mean, they, right. they, they give clues. And I think in terms of the layers of history, and then I think it's, you know, the boys went out to, uh, to have a place of refuge, to be liberated, but we know the history of water and African Americans going back to the right. transatlantic slave trade. Right. So there is this um, tra trauma associated with water, and I think that, you know, the constructions perhaps reveal some things, but also leave some things to sort of question in terms of thinking about the, I would say that also the genius of how do you deal with that trauma. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and so in a way, um, and uh, I was mentioning to you that we were, uh, a few of us were in conversation with uh, Tina Camp today on this idea of, of, uh, of refusal, of not sort of you know, putting it all out there, but a practice of refusal that resists. And it seems to me that these constructions are also kind of operating in that liminal condition where some things are, are clues or are indices, but other things are beneath all of the layers of paint and material on the surface. I think that is a product of that kind of thinking, right? So if we were to uh, really think about what you just said and lay it on any of those people, they have those, they, they lay out through their self-liberation those same ideas, right? Refusal, things that are hidden, things that are revealed, things over time, things that are strategized, right? Some things are uh, given and some things are not. So I think that kind of measurement or idea of um, refusal has many different um, sort of ontological conditions, right? And what I mean by that is that when you look at these kinds of histories of becoming black in these ships, in this water, on this water, and I say in this water and on this water simultaneously, um, we think about how we got to where we are and then both in the, the trauma of dying, death, and, and um, I'll say dying slow deaths, dying quickly over time, and refusing that kind of condition of a fourth death by figuring out how to self-liberate, like how does one, how do we track those, how do we track that even beginning, right? How do we question that um, kind of impulse? And when I think about that um, in terms of the constructions of the paintings, it kind of, it kind of ends up like that, just as the process of um, um, researching these kinds of histories. If I'm building the paintings the same, the same kind of, well, if I'm building the paintings thinking about Eugene Williams, inevitably there's going to be an under and over. Inevitably there's going to be something hidden and not. Inevitably there's going to be ideas of distance and, and time and life and um, passing, right? So the idea of what, where something comes from and where something is and what, how to make meaning of all of that, inevitably things are gonna, you know, things are gonna be refused, things are gonna be, you know, welcome, things are gonna be negated, things are gonna be quiet. And so all of these things I think help me make the pain, right? So I mean I, I think that's is that the yeah, question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Um but I, I don't necessarily it's it's interesting to have this conversation with you because we've collaborated before. And I'm always, I always wonder what architects are thinking or people who make constructions for who, who with the intention of um, you know, having someone occupy these things. Sorry, I, I think I know. No, 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 that's Jody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to your point, it, it's, it's, the raft was made in secret. Yeah. Right? So the, the, the rap was made in secret until it was known. And I'm sure the people, um, I'm sure the, the, the people who didn't know these little, uh, these, these, black, these black boys could actually make something like that. And when it was seen, I'm sure it was a shock. Right? And, and for me, you know, doing for, for black people to make something often, we have to do it in secret because the newness of it or the shock of seeing uh, something made by black people, black people that you didn't expect made often brought violence. Often brought violence, you know? So the idea of a black middle class, right? The, the idea of, you know, you have a piano in their home, but they got a piano, it was secret. But once it's known, they're in danger if they're in proximity to, um, you know, communities like, you know, poor white communities who, who are angered at black people actually living the American dream economically and culturally. Right? And so the idea of secrets is something that's ingrained 
um, in the culture because we want to stay alive, <laughs> you know? And, and to another degree, the making of the raft their climate change, right? And I'm not thinking we all may have to make a raft at some particular point if we think about climate change. So the metaphor itself, you know, you begin in blackness and invention and the danger of that invention being revealed, but that being a signal to we're all going to be vulnerable at some particular point if we don't pay attention to climate change and what then metaphorically will be our raft, right? So that day, what, what, the, what um, the young boys were doing is they were swimming in the beach, you know, Lake Michigan, so it's all of this sort of runoff from industry, industry. And they named the place black, um, white, I'm sorry, uh, hot cold. Because at one moment the water would be hot, and the other moments the water would be cold. From that industrial runoff, right? They still entered the water, they still played there, right? This sort of determination. Again, instead of seed to seed. This, they, then they had to hide the raft every day they left it, right? So they had to tie it up. They had to make sure they could come back to it. And what, I mean, at least what, 14, 15, right? So the idea that we don't hunt these stories down, right, after all the all the tragedy that's happening because of climate change and global warming and global stuff. Um, if we don't figure out those stories of triumph and those stories of spatial negotiation and materiality as it relates to water and industry and infrastructure, um, what are we doing, right? So by understanding these stories completely and their spatial significance, we understand the science, right? We understand the material conditions, right? That wood was wet, it absorbed the water, you know? Wood is it's slippery, you know? Because of course algae forms and then it multiplies and it feeds on itself. It's a science, right? So you're getting up on it, they're getting down, you know, on this sort of slippery piece of wood that was made whatever they could find. Um, so in my mind, stories like this, um, we're going to have to, we can't think about our roofs the same, we can't think about our furniture the same, we can't think about elevations the same, we can't think about these kinds of um, built environments the same. Um, and I mean now, I don't mean an existential threat, I mean for people of color around the world that it's affecting yesterday, the day before that, 10 years ago talking about climate change as we look at it right now. So I think that these stories have got to be, um, I have to make my exhibitions about them. Uh, and, you know, Oran uh, sort of mentioned, you know, what is significant about the work is the sort of dignity that you've given to, to the boys. And, and I mentioned that I think that the paintings are constructions. Right. Yes, the paintings. Yes, yeah, the, 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 no, I'm going to come back to this. The paintings are constructions, but in sort of, let's say, uh, excavating the stories which have been suppressed or um, or hidden or even denied, um, and making your constructions, it also seems to kind of point towards a kind of future, or at least a kind of optimism. I suppose and that you are constructing something new out of this that's not simply about the trauma of, of the past, or even, let's say, the trauma um, you know, or the risk of climate change, but that you're constructing. There's a creative process that comes out of this, which you know, the creation seems to be about the kind of future. And so I'm wondering if you might sort of maybe talk about, you know, if you're thinking about the future relative to sort of climate change in a kind of positive way or in terms of what you're making, now that, that to me the work is moving from painting and becoming more and more architectural. You know, we've also kind of talked about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, I, and I should mention even the, um, and everyone will see when we go over there, but the black glass pieces as well, and, and the way in which they sort of change the condition of that existing space and point towards a different space or a future of that gallery? I don't think 
I, this is the way I think that I consider time when I'm making my work. So there is no future that I'm working towards. There is no, in, in terms of this like linear thing between past, present, and future. Um, I'm really thinking about conditions of black death in a way, in a way, not in, in relationship to trauma, but also in relationship to a kind of brilliance that happens because of that, right? I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't think about climate change as an existential threat. I don't think about it in, in, in terms of, you know, kind of years away. I don't think about it as a, something that's not personal. I think it's a very kind of personal condition. After Katrina, I have like 30 people at my house. I was teaching a spellment. Katrina happened six days later. I was feeding everybody, right? So there's no, mm, I, I, don't, I don't think about it that way as something that I need to do to save our future. I think about it, climate change, particularly global warming, again, people in the global south, as a, as, a, as a way to uh, deal with the people who are around me right now in proximity, right? People that I know, you know, in coastal cities now, people that I know live in um, cities that where super highways are making these hot zones, people that I know are, you know, living and dying on breath and water, clean water, bad water. So I think it's a kind of condition where we have to recalibrate right now how we think creatively in the arts with a capital A as it relates to climate conditions. So the paintings are a critical response to, I think they're critical because I'm trying to get to a way people deal with climate, right? In different kinds of climate, right? There's the climate of industrialized white supremacy. So that those boys were in multiple climate conditions. It was the climate, the water that was coming from the industrial waste. It was the racists that threw rocks at them and killed one of those um, boys. It was the climate of the water. It was the material of the raft. So they were existing under these kinds of climate conditions where a black death occurred. So in that way, I am working spatially to figure out what I need to know right now that I don't know. But when, so, I don't. But, but the water moves. Yes, yes, And absolutely. so there, the water does, water does have a yes. past and a future for migrating from. Does the water have a past and a future? Well, there's a time element, right, in terms of. Maybe emotion element. Emotion Maybe element. a. State change element. A state change, yes. But that's but the state change happens in at cycles. a later time or in cycles. Right? So moving from Katrina to, or moving from New Orleans to Houston or to LA and whether or not you come back or not, but you know, there is something uh, maybe it's distance or maybe it's uh, in terms of duration or what have you. So maybe not future in terms of Futurism or optimism about the about the future, but in terms of here and there, I suppose, mm -hmm. particularly in terms of things like migration and water as geography. Right. So I think of the word I use uh, is distance. Yes. Right. Distance, yes. So I've been making these ex exhibitions, thinking about distance, and trying to replace the idea of distance because people do ask me about time in the work, and instead of using the word time, I try to use the word distance. And what distance allows me as another tool is to consider both the story of Eugene, both the stories of those people that were at my house, and both the stories of people in Vietnam, both the stories of people in Houston. So, and, and so I know that geographically they are far from me, right? So I think about that distance. I know that I have a memory of Katrina. That for me, it's not time, so it's, it's, that's a distance right, in my memory. So when I am making paintings, scale is very important. So scale allows me to construct the sense of distance. 
And I also know that when we think about, when you guys think about scale and architecture, engineering, and infrastructure, how does the black genius, someone like Eugene Williams and his friend, then get scaled up, right, as a way to deal with space? Right, so that was an incident that happened. How do we scale up those kinds of conditions when we understand the waters are rising because they are in a constant state of change? So that's, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of constructing things that are, to me, measurable from an embodiment standpoint as a diver, as a swimmer, in relationship to distance. Another thing about distance, so when you're diving and so you're like 50 feet or 100 feet, I think I've gone down to like 120 feet, where you have this idea of visibility. So visibility is a condition of distance. I'm not thinking about time, I'm not thinking about, I'm thinking about what I can see in front of me and what's going on when it's like, oh, sharks. So I'm thinking about distance in that way in all conditions. So I know that when someone is in, I don't know, suffering from the aftermath of a tsunami, I know I think about that as distance. How far are those people away from me? How close are they to me? Right? How much how far how how much do I know? or don't know, and how can I close that distance between what I know and what I don't know as fast as I can? And how can I use abstraction to do the thing that this world is has completely been unable to facilitate? A kind of knowledge information of this world has completely been unable to facilitate. It's just happening too fast. So my distance is like, how can I construct a kind of knowledge from black history to climate change to you know, conditions of the global south, south that'll close that distance between what I know, what I need to understand, and what is happening right now you know, in terms of day-to-day -day issues of death and dying. So, so, no, I mean, so proximity, right? Proximity. So, proximity, proximity to um, proximity to, to the sort of psychological duration, the physical duration, to all of these things. So the boards have to think about, um, you know, let's stay, let's not get too close to those white people, right? So it's the psychological distance and then it's physical distance, right? And so, you know, what gets me about the exhibition in and of itself, right, is that we have all of the objects, right? I did that one right. We have all of the... <laughs> So we have all of the objects inside of the inside of the exhibition, and then you have to figure out what is your proximity, a body-to-body -body relationship to to those particular objects. And so, if those boys are thinking about how to stay away from that side of the beach because they're safer, being at a distance from those people who would likely attack them, you know, I mean, so when you walk through the exhibition, you have to sort of feel your way through the space because you know when you're down 150 feet below water, you know, vision is very important, right? Because there's a wall, right? But there's also the body, there's a perceptual thing that the body has that can feel the space around it. So when you're walking through the exhibition, it's not just the paintings, but it's the sculpture. It's the, it's the orientation of the sculpture. It is, you are Box Brown, kind of, right? You are in a space in which um, you have to sort of navigate and, and negotiate when you turn in what particular perspective. And the paintings themselves, they're, they're not just, okay, well, look at it straight. The painting straight, you look at it from the side, it's a different thing. The sculpture, you look at it from the side, it's a different thing. And so that kind of navigation of the space it sort of mirrors this idea of proximity, right. you know, to, to, to objects. Right. Yeah, I, I think it, it mirrors the idea of proximity. It also challenges uh, distance. Yeah. Right? Particularly, I think, the, you know, the black glass pieces. And, you know, we were talking about this when we walked through, I think, on, on yesterday, in the, in the way in which they visually sort of manipulate certain things about the space, which either they sort of collapse certain corners of the room or they expand certain corners of the room. So you know, there is this proximity, there is this distance. And again, I would think of the, again, not paintings, and perhaps even the, the sculptures, not even as sculptures, but as devices.
Right, yeah, so the, that idea of the history of people making devices to self-liberate, I, I, that's what you know, I want to make work about. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we could, we could probably go on and you and I will have more, many more conversations, uh, but I think it really would be great for everyone to enjoy uh, the exhibition. I'd really like, like to thank everyone for turning out on Friday evening, uh, you know, during happy hour, I guess. Um, but it, again, thank you so much for what you've given to Columbia GSAP, what you've given to our community, and for letting us be engaged in a conversation with your work.